Batman first debuted back in 1939, Detective Comics issue 27. The world's greatest detective would soon become a pop culture phenomenon, enthralling millions of readers over his almost century long career in comics and in other media, and continues to endear us to this very day. But as with any character with a long, complex history, there are a few aspects that have left us a little befuddled. So today we're breaking down the parts of the Bat story that have left fans scratching their heads, with our list of the top 10 things we don't understand about Batman. Buckle up, friends, this is a long one. Let's get to it. Starting us off in at number 10, the Batcave Trophies. Have you ever wondered why Batman has so many strange objects in the Batcave? He's got a T-Rex statue, a giant penny, and an oversized Joker cart. There is a ton of memorabilia decorating his headquarters. Now these objects are from Batman's earlier adventures in the comics, many pulled from the stories penned by Dick Sprang. The T-Rex itself is from Batman Chronicles issue 8, where the Cape Crusader duked it out with a mechanical T-Rex in a theme park. Alfred had suggested that he keep it as a trophy in the Batcave to remind him of his successes. So we did. That giant penny, well it's often believed to be a reference to Two-Face, but that is incorrect. It's actually from a comical villain called the Penny Plunderer, although the New 52 changed this to be a piece of art that Lucius Fox used to help Batman take on the Riddler. And that giant Joker card? It's from a time that Batman defeated the Joker at one of his lairs, where the Clown Prince of Crime used oversized models of casino games to screw with Bruce. Batman also took home a pair of giant dice from that encounter in Batman issue 44 from 1947. Up next, number 9, all of the Robins. There have been a whole whole lot of Robins over the years. Who is who? Why have there been so many? And how many of them are actually related to Bruce Wayne? Well, let's break it down. First off, there's Dick Grayson, the OG Robin. He first appeared in 1940's Detective Comics issue 38, introduced as a way to make Batman more accessible to kids and to harvest a younger readership. It doubled Batman's sales. By the time the late 60s and early 70s rolled around, DC was allowing Grayson to age. He had become a franchise of his own with the Teen Titans and eventually adopted a new mantle in 1984, Nightwing. This left the position of Robin empty. Enter Jason Todd, who first appeared in 1983 and initially was a complete carbon copy of Dick Grayson, even straight down to the aesthetics, minus having red hair, which he would later dye, and then that was also later retconned so that he had dyed his hair to make Batman happy, which is kind of weird. Generally, we try to forget that was a thing. Todd would endure some creative changes after Crisis on Infinite Earths, getting a new origin that made him a street kid, a rebel who was difficult to work with. Fans did not like this new Robin all that much, which then led to the controversial A Death in the Family story arc, in which fans were given the opportunity to call in and vote on whether or not Jason Todd would be killed off. That did not end well for Jason. The Joker beat him to death and Batman was traumatized. Todd would later return in 2005 as an anti-hero called Red Hood. Next up is Carrie Kelly, who is a Robin from an alternate universe, appearing in Frank Miller's Batman The Dark Knight Returns. She's most notable for being the female Robin, and this series thematically explored Batman's trauma and increasingly unhinged nature thanks to his Robin history. He was not a fan of Carrie becoming Robin. Eventually he got on board though, because she helped him a lot and saved his life. Back into what's canon though. Next up is Tim Drake, who appeared in 1989 in Batman issue 436. He was a bit of a mix between Dick and Jason's personality traits, kind of clobbered together. In 1993, he managed to get his own solo series, which was the first Robin to get his very own title. He would eventually become the Red Robin. For a hot second, Stephanie Brown would become Robin, but then was retconned during DC's reboot with the New 52 in 2011. And that brings us to our final Robin, Damian Wayne, Batman's actual son. Now he debuted as a character back in Batman issue 655 as part of the Batman and Son storyline. His mother is Talia Al Ghul, who had raised and trained him for years, hiding. His existence until one day she left him in Bruce's custody. He was a bit of a problem child, violent and angry. Eventually, though, he would become Batman's Robin, even into the New 52, but did get killed off in Batman Incorporated, although he was then revived 2014's Robin Rises. Lots of retcons. He's also the one who is pals with Superman's son and the Robin who loved Batcow, so there you have it, friends. In at 8, Batman vs. Superman. Oh joy, this film. Calling it a film seems like that's too much artistic merit though to be honest with you guys. This recent cinematic portrayal of Batman left a lot of fans scratching their heads. Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice was not a good movie. It's true, get over it. If you're of the same opinion as we are though, no this number is not going to explain why the film got made or many of the other perplexing offensive studio based questions that may be running through your mind. This number aims to explain the confusing nightmare scene in the movie, which is arguably the most baffling 
opening sequence in the entire thing, and that is saying a lot. Batman is in the Batcave checking out some files that he stole from Lex Luthor that he's hoping will help him figure out where to get his mitts on kryptonite. He discovers files for other super powered individuals in the process. All of a sudden, there's a hard cut to Batman wearing a trench coat in the desert. He starts looking around for kryptonite, but is set up and a bomb goes off. Then some soldiers show up wearing Superman's insignia on their chest, and some weird flying creatures show up taking out Batman's allies. Next thing we know, he's in a dungeon tied up. Superman appears, murders his allies, and then blames Batman for taking Lois away from him. He then punches a hole right into his chest. We cut back to Batman at his computer in the Batcave, and then some weird dude surrounded by light shows up in a portal telling him that he's too early, that Bruce is right about him, and that Bruce needs to save Lois Lane. Bruce then wakes up in front of his computer. This is all apparently a vision presented to Bruce by the Flash, who was the dude in the light portal. And the whole too early bit is the Flash showing up too early thanks to him arriving due to time travel. This is supposed to be some sort of vision from an alternate version of the Flash, warning him that Superman will become evil if Lois Lane dies. Moving on. In at number 7, the plot armor. When it comes to superhero versus debates, Batman generally manages to come out on top in most cases. This is thanks to the fact that, if he's given enough time to prepare, he can arguably take down anyone or anything. Case in point, JLA Tower of Babel. Batman's files on his Justice League counterparts are stolen by Ra's al Ghul, revealing that he had a backup plan to take down all of his superpowered peers and allies in a worst case scenario situation, which was kind of seen as a big betrayal on his part. Anywho, over the years, Batman notoriously defeats characters he really should have no business in defeating. This, my friends, is called plot armor, a term that refers to a character's unusual or unlikely ability to survive infinite amounts of damage or terrible circumstances, all thanks to their importance within that story or story universe. So there you have it, people. Batman has plot armor. Up next at 6, why he didn't marry Catwoman. Or rather, why she did not marry him. Recently, there was some major controversy stirred up by Tom King's run on Batman. Batman and Catwoman were set to be married. Selena decided last minute though to not marry Bruce, which off a ton of fans, and Tom King even got death threats over it. So why did this happen? Well, Selena realized that a Bruce Wayne who is happy cannot exist with Batman, and the world needs Batman. Selena, in trying to be a hero, decides to sacrifice her needs and her love for Bruce because that would rob the world of Batman. Which retrospectively is kind of funny since that was also the Joker's reasoning for trying to kill Selena an issue earlier in that run, so… Up next at 5, Frederick Wortham and the Bat Family. The Golden Age Batman is very different than the Silver Age Batman. Now, for context, the Golden Age is categorized as the boom of American comic books between 1938, starting with the introduction of Superman, to 1956, with the Silver Age running from 56 to 1970. While the conclusion of World War II played a very large role in the shift of the kinds of stories published and the motivation and context behind the actions of superheroes at the time, there was another major factor that distinguished a change in DC's Holy Trinity, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. That factor is a fellow named Frederick Wortham, a psychiatrist and author who published a book called The Seduction of the Innocent that specifically targeted comic books, claiming that they were corrupting young readers. It attempted to assert that reading comics would encourage similar behavior in children, something that was based on undocumented antidotes, with Wortham lacking actual scientific evidence that comics were responsible for changing the behavior of children. A lot of it was just assumptions. One of his claims was that there were hidden sexual themes in Batman's comics and that Batman and Robin were gay, and would make kids gay themselves. According to Wortham, I quote, They live in sumptuous quarters with beautiful flowers and large vases, and have a butler. It is like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. Because yes, having flowers and large vases makes you gay as f To be fair, the two of them did share a bed together, and there was actually a lot of really queer subtext, but hey. A Senate hearing occurred in 1953 and led to the Comics Code Authority, a mass censorship of comics that ended some publications altogether, like EC Comics, who survived only via Mad Magazine. This is where the Bat Family originates from. It's from a desire to make Batman look more family friendly and appealing, and to give him straight love interests like Batwoman in order to combat against the homosexuality claims. Because this was the 50s, it was not a progressive time. Uh, if only Wortham could see Batwoman now, he'd be rolling in his grave. In at number 4, The Silver Age and All That Camp. That actually leads us to our next point, talking about Batman and the Silver Age. One of the biggest confusions about the Cape Crusader is why he was so darn campy in the 50s and the 60s. The Comics Code Authority obviously had a lot to do with it. But DC also has a history of shifting his personality and methods to better sell to their audiences. A year after his initial debut by the time Detective Comics issue 38 rolled around in 1940, the publisher had completely removed the use of extreme violence and firearms in Batman's narratives, establishing his code of honor in a more rudimentary form. He would never kill 
sale again. Robin was also introduced, which majorly boosted Batman's sales. Now, after the Comics Code, DC built a whole Batman family, as we mentioned, which included Bat Hound and the impish Bat Mite, and many of his rogues gallery were discarded or just flat out neutered, becoming vanilla versions of themselves for years. Eventually, though, after Julius Schwartz became the editor of Batman Comics at DC, some of the more campy, sci fi, silly concepts that plagued Batman's titles were exercised. The Bat Family minus Robin were ditched, and Robin was franchised out to become the leader of the Teen Titans. But despite this campy nature, the era was incredibly important for comic books and superheroes becoming integrated parts of pop culture and mass media. Arguably, the 60s Adam West Batman TV series introduced brand new audiences to Batman and superheroes, and thus began a trend that has only increased in fever in our current times. When the show premiered in 1966, it was a national phenomenon. It kept Batman afloat when his comic sales were dipping into questionable territory, and allowed for members of his rogues gallery to be reintroduced. He assumed the spotlight of World's Finest, the Justice League comics, and the Brave and the Bold. He may have lacked the dark personality traits and outlook that we know and love now, but this campy version was crucial in establishing a future for the Dark Knight and other comic book heroes. Up next at 3, why yellow? Here's a fun one. Why does Batman's insignia have that yellow oval around it? Now remember how we mentioned in our last number that Julius Schwartz came in and modernized Batman towards the end of the Silver Age? This happened in 1964, and is something referred to as the New Look Era. Adding that yellow was a way of updating Batman's appearance, with Carmen Infantino updating the look. But it did get an in-world justification too. Years later though, in Darwin Cook's DC The New Frontier. Now according to Batman, the change was due to him not wanting to scare children, which is actually kind of hilarious when you think about the reasons why Batman underwent all of those changes between the Golden Age and the Silver Ages to begin with. It also has a practical purpose too. It acts as a bullseye, a target that draws in Batman's foes to aim for the center of his chest, which is the most armored part of his bat suit. And at number two, the paranoia and identity crisis. One of Batman's most notable personality traits these days is his paranoia, but it wasn't always that way. Sure, he's been overly prepared, being a master strategist and tactician, but his paranoia was something that was introduced more so after Identity Crisis in 2004. That was a seven issue limited series that was considered controversial. The story began with the elongated man's wife, Sue Dibney, being murdered, and the JLA trying to find out who was responsible. It was then revealed that the villain Dr. Light had once raped Sue in the JLA satellite headquarters, and that the JLA members at the time voted to allow Zatanna to mind wipe Dr. Light and alter his personality to that. Of an ineffectual idiot. Then it was revealed that this mind wipe trick has occurred on multiple occasions. As the story progressed, Batman found out and then obviously disapproved. Apparently, he attempted to stop one of the mind wipes in the past, but was magically restrained and had his own memories of the incident removed. It is revealed that Batman remembers the events and is growing increasingly suspicious of his allies. He created the Brother MK1 satellite to monitor superhumans, which had later implications in DC's comics, and the growth of his paranoia increased substantially. And finally, in in our number one spot, his super friendship. Speaking of the Justice League, let's take a look at Batman and his relationship with DC's other iconic flagship hero, Superman. Over the years, the two have been depicted as best pals, yet they're constantly finding themselves fighting against one another. Why? Well, the two initially debuted within a year of one another, with Superman arriving in Action Comics 1 in 1938. The first time the two appeared together in the same story was during a brief cameo in All Star Comics issue 7, alongside Jay Garrick's Flash, raising money for a war charity for orphans. You could technically argue that this was the first time they met. That is actually one of the biggest question marks concerning their friendship. When did they actually first meet? It's a thing that's been retconned multiple times thanks to how many times DC has retconned what's canon. Anywho, in 1941 the two of them shared the cover of World's Finest Comics, but did not interact in the stories within that issue. We wouldn't get a Batman Superman interaction until 1952 in Superman issue 76. And two years later, thanks to World's Finest being consolidated, Bruce and Clark actually started teaming up on the regular. But back to issue 76 of Superman. This was claimed to be their first official meeting in a story titled The Mightiest Team on Earth, with the two of them coincidentally being on the same cruise ship when a diamond thief stirred up some trouble. They also coincidentally shared a cabin and secretly tried to change into their costumes without the other one knowing. You can imagine how well that went. For decades, the two would remain friends, allies, seeing each other as opposites, but with the same good intentions. Of course, this came to an end thanks to Frank Miller and The Dark Knight Returns, which drastically changed the way Batman narrated were written and perceived.
received. It featured an aged Batman fighting against Superman in a dystopian future. The latter hero being the only remaining legally sanctioned metahuman who served President Reagan as a lackey. That would forever alter their dynamic in the comics, with DC writers for years pinning the two against one another, expanding what their friendship entailed of and exploring what exactly it took for DC's two most powerful forces to turn on one another. All right, there we have it, friends. What other things about Batman confuse you? What are questions you've always had about the Cape Crusader? Let us know in those comments below, and hey, we'll see if we can do our best to answer them. Maybe do another list, a part two. If you guys dug this video, spread that love, hit that like button, and be sure to subscribe to Top 10 Nerd if you haven't already. We would love it if you stuck around with us some more. In the meantime, though, thanks for watching, friends. I'll catch you all in the next video.